who deserves our praise this morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning all. What a beautiful and wonderful day we had out there yesterday. And as we get ourselves set up and ready to go, get things in their place, and uh, what a wonderful, wonderful day the Lord has given. And it's going to be another beautiful one day today, and I pray you are having a great and glorious morning, Miss Jessica. So nice to see you, the first one up there this morning. We missed you Sunday. Uh, hope to see you back next Sunday. Miss Ruth, good morning to you. It's good to see you there. Buddy, Julia, we love you. Welcome, Atlanta. It's good to have you with us. Cynthia, Dale, Ryan, uh, always a pleasure. Great, great folk. Miss Terry, good morning to you. And Miss Sue, Miss Carolyn says, good morning all. Ron's surgery begins at 10 a.m. our time. Thanks for praying for him and his surgeon. So we have the opportunity to pray again today. Good morning, Alyssa, Cam, Kara, Cody. Good morning to you. Helen, good morning to you as well. Alyssa said, today is mine and my husband's 19th anniversary. 
so many great years, hoping for at least 19 more. Everybody give a hip, hip, a rag. Happy 19th anniversary. Share that with your husband as well. Uh, it's really kind of special, those anniversaries. Sherry and I passed 51 last March. Uh, Jerry says, good morning, dear family. We are so blessed to have you all in our lives. And boy, that is the truth. Oh, great day. Isn't God good? He gives us such a family. We get to rejoice with one another and help share one another's burdens. What a, what a, what a great, great, great God we have. And Miss Sherry says, congratulations to you, Alyssa, and your family. Uh, you guys do something special, I hope, uh, uh, and enjoy it and celebrate it. I know you're happy. I know we're, we're you know, you, you, you've just been a joy and bring joy into our lives. So thank you so very much. All of you do. It's I, I love looking up here and seeing all of you up there and, and the numbers of you that are out there that haven't signed in. You know, uh, I might get to the point if everybody begins to decide to sign in, we can't, you know, shout out every name. But as long as we can, as long as, you know, there's availability, we can try and do that. Because it's great to fellowship together, even if it's this way. And we can't see each other. Of course, you get to see lovely me. But uh, at any rate, good morning, good morning. Yesterday, we continued to look at the consequences of a life that uh, chases after folly. Uh, one that uh, lives their life foolishly, really. And so far, we've observed uh, you know, a few things. Uh, first of all, fool's arrogant babbling always destroys him. You know, they're... They talk, they say nothing, uh, you know, it, you know, well, we went into that quite in detail. Uh, fool's incompetence wears him out, uh, you know, to the point that uh, he doesn't even know where he's going. The third point we looked at yesterday was a fool's immaturity spells disaster for a nation. And, of course, verses 16 and 17 is, is where we get that. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad, whose princes feast in the morning. Uh, who have, in other words, for somebody who has no common sense, no wisdom, uh, no, no, you know, real dignity. Yeah, they, they don't know. You know, they, they're drunk from. They begin drinking in the morning, and you know, we went through all of this. Blessed is the land whose king is of nobility. Not that he is uh, from a royal line, but he has a noble character. Whose princes eat at the appropriate time. They take care of business. Uh, for, I mean, they eat for strength and not for drunkenness. They are not overindulgers. Uh, they're people with uh, their feet on the ground and uh, their eyes upon God. And they're people who uh, are, are, are good, noble, you know, have good character. I remember back in the 90s, we started moving away. Well, actually before that, but it really came to fruition when uh, you know people were trying to give a pass for bad behavior uh, to the president and said, well, you know, it, what he does in his private life uh, doesn't have anything to do with what he does in his public life, that character really doesn't matter. Well, character does matter. Character really is one of the only things that does matter when it comes to something like this. Because what we do in private, you know, when nobody is watching, you know, is always running underneath the surface and directs what we're going to do in public. I love the uh, the comment by Martin Luther King uh, uh, in his speech when he said he's looking for the day that people are judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So the content of one's character is important, and that's exactly what Solomon is saying here. You want leaders of good, proven character, uh, not leaders who uh, uh, you know have a reputation of being dishonest or disgruntled or uh, drunkards or liars or anything else. You want people of good character. It's getting a little difficult to find people running for high offices that have maintained through their life that kind of character. But that's what we need to be looking for. The fourth thing that we just moved into yesterday was a fool's laziness leads to discomfort and dysfunction. In verses 18 19, it says, Through indolence the rafters sag, and through slackness the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money answer and money is the answer to everything. Well, Solomon is really attempting to direct us to live a self-disciplined life. 
without which our lives would fall into disrepair like a neglected building whose roof sag and water seeps in, creating mold and mildew. But God, you know, did he yesterday, as we were going through, I identified one area that is a constant struggle for me. I don't know whether God uh, helped pin down or, or poke you a little bit in, in areas within your own life that tend to be in disrepair. Any area where there's a lack of self-discipline that needs to be tended to. You know, so many of the problems of our life would be uh, corrected if we, if we just brought those areas of our life under the authority of Christ and became self-disciplined. I like the way Paul talks about it. He says, uh, listen, I, I shadow box. I, I, I box so that if I get to the end of the race that I won't myself be disqualified. He brought his self, his body, his mind, his will, his emotion, brought his life in under self-control, under discipline, and put it under the control of God. Uh, and as long as I live in this life, there are going to be areas. There may be areas now that I have I have a handle on. I mean, they're they're discipline, and I live a disciplined life. But if I don't stay on that, it will slowly fall into disrepair, and I'll drift away from that self discipline, and it'll have to get brought back into line again. That's part of the human nature. Have you ever said to yourself, you know, I used to. I, I thought I'd conquered that. I, I, I thought I'd gotten over that. I, I thought I was beyond that, only to realize that you were, most definitely, at least for a season. But you see, if you don't stay on top of something, it's kind of like working out in the gym. You can get in good shape, but if you don't stay on top of that, then it'll be won't be long before you know, you're back in the shape you were in before. Uh, so if God identified an area, what'd you determine to do about it? Yesterday, we ended with verse 19. After prayer, we're going to pick right up on that verse and move forward because it's kind of one of those verses that people are going to real question mark about exactly what Solomon is trying to say. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for the joy that we have to be together today. And Lord, the expressions of joy on those who, who, who write in or, or text me or email me, Lord, I know that uh, you are are working in the lives of people through these studies, and I thank you for that. God, it is you that does the work and not us. We simply uh, follow along and, and, and follow your lead and open up your word and see what it says, and then it speaks to our hearts in such an individual fashion. I thank you, Lord, for those who are the youngest among us as well as the oldest among us and everyone in between. You are gracious and good, and Lord, we want to lift Ron up again this morning. Uh, not too many minutes from now, Lord, he'll be going into surgery just after we conclude this, uh, this Bible study. Lord, I pray that in these moments as he's preparing to go into surgery, that you give him a calm heart. Let, uh, let the peace of God just uh, flood him, fill him, surround him, along with his precious wife. And Lord, with, with Carolyn, with the family. Lord, just uh, give doctors, nurses, uh, give the ophthalmologists, whoever's doing the surgery, give them steady hands and, uh, and, and wise decisions. God, we love you, and we thank you for the privilege of praying for one another. Thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our heart, we just give you the glory that belongs to you. Now, Lord, take our time together. Open up the eyes of our understanding that we might see the very glory of God. Lord, teach us today. We pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into that 16th verse and take a look at it again. Solomon says, Men prepare a meal for enjoyment. Wine makes life merry. And money is the answer to all things. Now, when you look at it, it's kind of a flippant statement, and some people say that we should read it as a quotation spoken by the lazy man. Well, I'm going to eat a good meal, I'm going to be merry, I'm going to drink a little wine, money's the answer to all of my problems, but I don't see it that way. To me, I think the best interpretation of this verse is to take it to mean exactly what it seems to be saying. Feasting and wine are good and nice, but money answers everything. Now, of course, 
we if we do that, we have to read it within the context of what Solomon has already said about money. He's not going to contradict himself. The word doesn't contradict itself. And when you look at it in, 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 in the context that Solomon is giving us, we, we really shouldn't miss the point. Remember, Solomon has clearly told us in verses 1 through 6 that money will not satisfy, right? Wasn't that one of the basic themes? You couldn't find net value in your life for money. If you're looking for satisfaction in money, it's not going to be there. It cannot satisfy. It never will satisfy. That uh, you can collect all the riches of the world. And, of course, he had a lot of them, didn't he? We went through much of that when we were, were looking into those chapters. He was a wealthy man. But he found the accumulation of all the wealth in the world did not bring satisfaction to his heart. Didn't bring fulfillment, didn't give him purpose, didn't bring net value into his world. It, too, was like chasing the fog, like grabbing a hold of, of a puff of smoke. Uh, it was all mirrors. Yet, when he turns the corner in chapter 7 and begins talking about wisdom, Solomon admitted that, wis that, that, that money uh, does have its benefits. None of we're chasing it as the purpose of our life. But when everything is in order and, and our life is, is lined up correctly, money has its, its purpose. He says in chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, Wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable for those who see the sun, the living. For wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. Wisdom is superior to, to, to it all, right? That Knowledge tells us that. Uh, common sense tells us that. But you put the two together. When you get your life in, in, in order, in line, and, and you understand and you're operating wisely, then, then that inheritance, that money along with it, well, along with the, uh, the wisdom that you have, wisdom is good with an inheritance. Why? Because then you're able to handle both correctly. So in those verses, Solomon places money alongside wisdom and says that both are very handy to have. Now, if you try to find meaning in life through through money, you'll be you'll be totally dissatisfied. You'll fail utterly. But once you've got that settled, it's a good thing to work hard and to save some money. Now, take that and fast forward to our verse where Solomon has just spoken about laziness. Now he goes on to remind us that there is a value to money. His point being, as far as I can tell at least, that you ought to work hard and save money. Don't waste your money going out uh, to eat or on frivolous things, but be wise in the way you handle yourself. So interestingly enough, verses 16 through 19 touch on two of the areas in which people often have great difficulty exercising discipline, food and finance. And remember, this whole section is on being disciplined. Let me ask you, how do you do in those areas? Are you disciplined in your spending or do you often buy things strictly on impulse? Do you have a budget? You say, well, I don't have enough to have a budget. I don't make much. Listen, that's when you really need to have a budget so that you can make every dollar stretch as you can. Do you save? Do you exercise restraint when it comes to uh, what you eat and what you do? You're not gluttonous or, or whatever, and there's a lot of ways to be gluttonous. But, of course, there's one other area in this passage which Solomon encourages self-discipline. If food and finances are two, of the most difficult areas in which you and I have to exercise self-restraint, this one is right up there with them as well. It's actually the topic that we begin this section with. So Solomon really is coming around full circle and coming back to the first topic that he has. It's the approach to our speech, to the way we talk, to our tongue. One of the consequences of folly is that a fool's insolence comes back to bite him. A fool's babbling, his words, oftentimes, is the trap that traps him. Listen to verse 20. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse the king, 
and in your sleeping rooms do not curse the rich man. For a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. Does that sound like a uh, familiar phrase? There's a couple of things you, you got to love about this verse. First is the way that Solomon uses what has really become a common metaphor. How many of you can guess what that metaphor is? Raise your hand. Anybody out there? A bird of the heavens will carry the sound and the winged creature will make no, the matter known. Of course it is. A little birdie told me. You ever heard that? How did you find that out? Well, a little birdie told me. That's where that little quote comes from. That metaphor has been around since ancient times. We find it in extra biblical writing as well as, as here in Solomon's words. I don't know if Solomon came up with it or he heard it and it was a common expression today that he used. But regardless, here it is. Now, what are we meaning to communicate when, a, when we say a little birdie told me? For one, we're probably trying to keep our source anonymous, but we're also saying something about the nature of communication. <laughs> and this is it, that word gets around. Word gets around. And it may not always be the word that you speak. It may be part of the words you speak, but by the time it gets around, it's nothing like it started out to be, right? And we all know that little that little game, well, some of you younger ones may not, where uh, you get a whole room full of people and you whisper a secret in the ear of one and they're to pass it on, and then the last person in the room shares what that is, and then you see just how the message has changed from what it was first given. Well... Word gets around. Little birdie, the wind just just carries our words to the four corners. Uh, well, so we we're really trying to communicate that what we say really never stays in secret. Anyone who has spent any time on this earth knows that if you tell someone something, chances are it's going to get around. That's one of the, 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 the biggest bugaboos that I have in life is confidentiality. If you tell me something in confidence, it's going to stay there. But so many people have a hard time grasping that because we don't see a lot of confidence. Uh, I've been in meetings where we've had, uh, we've had diffusings and things. And, and the, the rule of thumb it is in those meetings, what says in the meeting stays in the meeting because people are sharing their rawest thoughts. And then to have that come back and, and, and be in another meeting of people and have that very thing come out in that meeting and to find out that it was somebody, another chaplain or whatever, that went ahead and somebody told this chaplain and he went ahead and started spreading. I get so angry. I've walked out of meetings. Because confidence, privilege, is something that is vitally, vitally important to me. But I won't say that I've been perfect. There's times I have said things off the cuff that have literally moved around back and come back, and I've said it without malice or without intent, but by the time it comes back to me, it's, it, it's, it's a big problem. We have to bridle our tongue. We have to keep it under control. Sometimes people are motivated by gossip or with a malicious intent, and sometimes it's completely innocent. It's just simply a slip of the lips. But that causes problems for the person who is in the habit of cursing the king. Now, this is somewhat hard for us to fathom, comprehend in our today's society. In our culture, almost anything goes when it comes to what we want to say about uh, national or state leaders or anybody else. Even very public venues. People criticize one another viciously all the time. It's tragic, but uh, better that than, I guess, living in a country where the king controls everything that you can or can't say, like having a bureau of disinformation that uh, monitors your very thought and speech. A little Orwellian, I think, when you think about those kind of things. 
if you criticize or even curse the president, in our culture, maybe nothing's going to happen to you as long as you don't threaten his life. Or even then, you might not really get into trouble. Remember the comedian who held up a box ever dead of Donald Trump as a commentary of her feelings toward Trump? She had every right to feel the way she does about Trump. But that would kind of took it over the hill, didn't it? And though there was some backlash, there was no real punishment. Backlash came from the public more than it came from anything else. But if you ever cursed an ancient Near Eastern king, it would be off of your head. Uh, we'll be looking, you know, when we look at some of these kings, I mean, can you imagine cursing uh, Nebuchadnezzar and having it get back? What would happen? You see, these people had absolute sway over life and death. Now, you know, Solomon just says, don't do it. Now, that's obviously good advice, but does everyone know that you shouldn't even do so in your bedchamber or, if you will, in your thought life? This is where the second thing that you've got to love about this passage comes in. Because Solomon recognizes that something as dangerous as cursing the king should not even be done in the privacy of one's home or even their thought life. Why? Well, the reason why you shouldn't curse the king in your bedroom is pretty obvious. Someone may overhear and rat you out. You think you're among friends, but you can never be too careful. Loose lips sink ships was the, the phrase throughout World War II, was it not? But why not curse the king in your thought life, at least? After all, no one reads your mind, can they? Well, the reason why Solomon says not to curse the king in your thoughts is that uh, he knows, like Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're used to cursing the king in your head long enough, one day, one day you're going to do it out loud, and the word's going to get back to the king, and you're going to lose your life. In other words, the idea here is, is to, to keep control of your thought life. Keep it under, uh, under the authority. Keep it disciplined. You go there, get out of there. Your mind's going to wander there. You need to turn back and get out of there. You see, there's a progression to these things. It all starts with what, what's between the ears, in your head, in your heart. That's why Proverbs 4 and verse 23 says to us that we must watch over our heart with diligence for from it flows the springs of life. Now, who wrote that is the same person who wrote this in Ecclesiastes. Uh, God hears you and your heart does not reflect his. That's, that's absolutely true. And it's hard to control the thought life. What does Paul say? He says, I beseech you, therefore, the brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable and your act of reasonable, worshipful service. Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, But be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized, metamorpho, be transformed like a caterpillar to a butterfly, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Listen, uh, you remember the war in Iraq, of course. Well, some. Some were too young to remember much about it, I guess. Whatever you agree, whether you agree with it or not, that's not the point. Do you remember the reason, though, for fighting that war? It was that if we fight terrorism there, we won't have to deal with it over here. Now, kind of thought about that, you know, through this as, as an illustration of why we should guard our heart. Because if we fight sin here, chances are not, are, it won't come out nearly as often out here. If I get control here, you see, I don't do anything in my life that doesn't pass through my mind first. I think it was Tim Lahey that wrote the book, you know, Battle for the Mind. It's a good book. Old, you probably might not even find it, may not even be in print anymore. But the battle is for the mind. 
Because everything that I do outward is an issue from the heart. It goes through the mind first. You say, well, I, I didn't even think when I did that. Well, yeah, you did. You may not have thought it. It may have been a quick thought. But you see, you had no action that your brain wasn't involved in. So, if we fight the battle here, and we win the battle there, we won't be compounding it out here. I should point out that the primary reason we should respect governing authorities is that God told us to do so, and that doing so glorifies him. There are two character qualities here uh, that are glaringly absent in the life of the fool. And he's pointed these out to us. Humility and self-discipline. If the fool was humble, he wouldn't talk so much. If he was submitted to God's rule over him, he wouldn't feast and neglect the responsibilities of state. And you can go on and on and on. Humility and self-discipline. So the key to not being a fool is, first of all, be humble and submit to God's rule in your life. And the second is, do the hard things. Do the hard things. Don't remember, I don't remember where I heard it, but I've been reminding myself, you know, the past couple of weeks that one of the biggest keys to my happiness and success in life is learning to say no to myself. Things that I thought, you know, I, I, I want to run out and do this or do this or get that or get that. Say, no, it isn't the right time. Say no to myself. How many of you have trouble saying no to yourself? If you master the art of simply saying no, not to everybody else around, but to ourselves, is your life currently submitted to God's rule in every area? This is the way to avoid foolishness along with this uh, disastrous consequences. Now, having concluded chapter 10 here with those thoughts, we're going to move on to chapter 11, and, and, and we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 6 to begin with. He says, another opens up with another very familiar phrase, just like he did in, in chapter 10, when he says, uh, fly gets in the ointment or in the perfume and, and, and spoils it. And then in verse 11, chapter, one, or chapter 11, verse 1 says, uh, cast, your care, cast your bread upon the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. If the clouds are full and they pour out rain upon the earth, whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks to the clouds will not reap, just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you don't know the activity of God who makes all things. Oop, didn't get ahead of myself there. Sow your seeds in the morning, and not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. Well, we need to pull together a, a couple of major themes in Ecclesiastes. First, the topic of work. All right? That's the first topic. Starting in verse 3, we saw that, that, that work is going to be a major theme in this book. Chapter 1, verse 3, lays that out for us. It's going to be one of those major themes. Go all the way back. Remember, I mentioned to you this is a major theme when we were there. First, there was the understanding that everyone works. We were made to work, every one of us. We were created to work. We were made to work. We were given work. Even before the fall, Adam worked. Work is not because of the fall. I've had people say, well, if there weren't sin, we wouldn't have to work. There's a theological term for that. It's called baloni. All right, you can say that with me. It's 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 a, a, a nice Greek word, baloni. Adam and Eve. Adam was given work to do, wasn't he? In the garden, work is a blessing from God, not a curse. Now, the toil in work is part of the curse, yes, but not work itself. Do we understand that? 
everyone was created to work. We were made to work. And yet also uh, this recognition that in many ways work is futile. Work is futile because of sin. Work has purpose, and when it's put in the right frame and God is in control of everything, then it brings profit to the life, and, and, and it's a blessing. But when work becomes uh, the, the slave master, if you will, when things are out of balance, then work is futile. When we're looking for that to fulfill our life, it's futile. Mankind will never fix all the problems in this world, no matter how hard he tries. And work will never satisfy you. In fact, if work is, 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 is not uh, first mixed with godly contentment, as Paul says, it will make you miserable. You can't control your life through work, yet the wise man works. And he works hard. And he works smart. Now, we've been covering all this, haven't we? In fact, just uh, uh, in the last week, we were talking about this very point, weren't we? Work smart. Work wise. Uh, plan. All of these things. Now, the second topic I'd like to address before going further is the theme of God's sovereignty. Here we go. Get back to that keystone. Get back to putting the weight that needs to be put on the sovereignty of God. Solomon has a lot to say about God's sovereignty as well. He started by affirming it in chapter 3, verse 11, that God's sovereignty is good and perfect, that he makes everything beautiful in its time. How all, however, he also says that in, in that passage, as well as in others, that God's sovereignty is inscrutable. It cannot, we cannot understand it, nor can we control our own lives, that God is in control. The control for us is a matter of illusion. That being the case, we cannot possibly know the future. No matter how hard we work, no matter how diligently we plan, bad stuff might happen. In fact, often does, as well as some very good stuff. So we are past the point of striving for control in terms of Solomon's argument. Solomon has sufficiently humbled us. He's driven this point over and over and over again, and he's brought us to our knees, so to speak, figuratively. Now the question is, how do we respond to our lack of control? Some people might be tempted to respond with paralysis. That it, it, it's that state of uh, uh, fight, flight, or freeze kind of thing, and they they're, they're paralyzed. They they might be tempted to think, I if I step out of uh, on the limb, it might break, and if I go out of my way to try something new, bad stuff may happen. So I'm just going to stay right here in my comfort zone. In fact, I'm going to curl up in a little ball and do nothing. Especially if you've been out there and you've you put yourself on the line and things didn't work out the way you thought they ought to work out, we're tempted to say, oh, I'm not going to try that again. It's like somebody that has been, been, been hurt in a relationship. I'm not ever going to get into another relationship. Would, would that be the right response or the wrong response to God's sovereignty? I think it'd be the wrong response. The right response, according to this passage, is boldness. And here's why. God's providence is inscrutable, but not capricious. And what does that mean? Simply this. Just because I don't understand what God is doing. For instance, and he covered this, when he allows injustice and misfortune, I might not understand what God's doing. Doesn't mean that he is random or that he acts on will. If God were random, then it would be foolish to try anything. Why? Because doing nothing would be just as likely to produce success as doing something. It's all just a toss of the dice, so why exert oneself? And a lot of people live that way. Oh, I'm not going to make a decision here, a decision there. I'm not going to do this or that. It's all a toss of the dice. It's going to come out the way it's going to come out. Why should I labor? However, we all know that that is not the way this universe works. 
The world typically operates according to a set of principles, and those principles render initiative and hard work pro <coughs> profitable, at least most of the time. Certainly not all of the time. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So because this world is not random, and because we do serve under a benevolent king, a loving God, a, an almighty father, who is working all things together for my good and his glory, we ought to work boldly despite the fact that we cannot control the future and that bad stuff is bound to happen from time to time. So what does that look like? What does it mean to work boldly? Well, that's where our passage comes in. So I want you to look at the first thing that he has. Oh, there we go. Uh, second topic I didn't give to you. Well, I gave it to you, but I didn't put it up there. Uh, going for, uh, further on the theme of God's sovereignty. Work boldly. Look at this very familiar passage. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Now, there's been some debate over how to interpret verses 1 and 2. And how you interpret these verses affect, in turn, your interpretation of the rest of the passage. So let's talk about it. Some people have, have interpreted verses 1 and 2 as references to generosity. In other words, cast your bread upon the waters, a metaphor for giving to others. And, it, you know, it's going to come back to you. Okay? I've, I've heard sermons on that, that topic. The problem is that the argument for that interpretation is, is, is really kind of weak. So I think it's it, it, it's better. Now, I, I'm not saying it's insufficient. I'm not, you know, that you can't you know, see it that way, I understand where they're coming from, but I, I think there's a weakness in the argument. I think it's better to take verses 1 and 2 in reference to, to commerce, to, to economy. So work boldly and work creatively. Uh, let, let, let me give you this before we close. The Hebrew word translated cast here is better translated to send forth as in send forth your bread upon or over the waters. And that translation brings to mind Solomon's oversee trade activities, which we read about, and we did, we studied in, in, in you know, here, you know, earlier on in this book, we went over to 1 Kings chapter 9 and, and chapter 10 and looked at uh, uh, where some of this thought pattern of, of Solomon's was coming from. So I, I think we're talking about here our work and, and, and our investment. And, and we'll break this apart tomorrow, and you'll see, I think, with greater clarity what it is that I'm talking about that I believe Solomon is relating to in context of what we've just come through, okay? In context of living a disciplined, ordered life under the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm a big one to try and look at the context of something before I make my general interpretation because I'm afraid that if I pull something out of its context, I'll lose, I'll, I'll kind of have a pretext and I'll lose the very heart and core of what is being said. Now, I can see, for example, in the area of giving where this would fit in. Give and it shall be given back to you. Press down, good measure, shaken together. And, 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 you know, I would say that would be accurate to look at it in that, but it wouldn't be the fullness of what's being said because it's out of context to where it's being said. All right? Now, that being said, I've said a lot of sense here. That being said, it's time to close up for today, and we'll pick up here tomorrow about work boldly and work creatively. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for loving us, loving us beyond all measure, guiding us in your word, giving us a fullness of understanding, opening the mind of our understanding to see and, and, and know what it is that God is saying, that we may know that we know that we know you. Lord, that we may take upon ourselves your yoke, 
knowing that it's light and, and, and your birth is easy, knowing that you carry it if we will surrender to you, that you have given us work to do and you've given us you, you've given us a life to live and Lord that we might have the wisdom to live it under your control and not out of control. God, thank you for your word today. Lord, may you have spoken to each of us and may we have marked down those areas that you say, today, let's work at this. And Lord, let us rejoice in, in, in just wearing your suit today. To you be glory and honor, Father, in all that we do or participate in. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, as always, if God has kind of poked somewhere, that's the somewhere he wants to look at today. So enjoy the day. Carolyn, let us know how your brother does. Uh, we're going to pray for him just before we close again. But let us know how he does. Father, I thank you for Ron. And again, he's very close to going into surgery. So, Lord, we put it all in your hands, knowing that you have taken care of the matter. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, you all have a blessed day. And may God multiply his, his discernment, his wisdom in your life so that you can see what he's doing and you can say, oh, God, let me join you. You have a great day. All right. And I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. God bless all of you.